Are you ready? Stand by. Welcome to the Three Gun Show, brought to you by Armalite. I'm your host, Dave Hartman, and my guest this week is Three Gunner Josh Tarrant. Josh, how you doing? I'm doing great, Dave. Uh, happy to be back. Nice. It's great to have you back. And we have an interesting topic for today. We're going to be talking about uh, performance versus expectation of performance. But before we get into that, a uh, couple things I want to tell the audience. Uh, we got the the Patreon account, and I've got some cool stuff coming up that is that I'm able to do all thanks to the people on Patreon. And uh, Josh, if you're curious, I'll tell you after we <laughs> after the show here. But a uh, big surprise coming up. And I wouldn't be able to do it without the uh, support for the Patreon uh, from the Patreon crew. So thank you to everyone that has signed up for support on that. Uh, If you're interested in helping out and supporting the show through Patreon, it's patreon.com slash three gun show. That's P A T R E O N. And uh, you can get access to things right away in that, such as the, uh, the match recon podcasts Um, first dibs on uh, three gun show apparel and all kinds of other good stuff. You can check it out all there. Uh, also, be sure to listen after the show for a special offer from Armalite. And uh, now, Josh, what have you been up to, man? Just the same old thing, man. Just uh, training a lot, getting ready for uh, the last end of the season here. Uh, November is going to be a little uh, a little nutty for me, so just trying to get some training under the way and keep things uh, rolling along. Nice. So uh, I was uh, internet stalking you, uh, as I do on the daily, and you've been doing some uh, some sling work and positional work for getting ready for Blue Ridge. Yeah, this will be my first time shooting Blue Ridge. I've uh, I've managed to avoid it, not not on purpose, just uh, how things worked out. I think it was a uh, direct conflict with with uh, nationals the last couple of years. So, oh yeah, but this year I get this year I get to do it. So I'm excited. Yeah, it's a it's a fun match. I shot one third of it last year and really enjoyed it. So um, I uh, I encourage you to shoot the whole thing. Yeah, my only memory of the match last year was the video of you falling down that just like <laughs> blew the internet away. <laughs> yeah. Um, Brian Corey, uh, I, he caught me at a, what the heck was the match? Pro Am in uh, you know at, at Rock Castle in Kentucky, and he assured me that he found the stump and he tore it out. Oh, I I wouldn't doubt that Brian did that. He's a he's a super detailed guy. But yeah, uh, kind of on that topic of falling down, there's some great video footage of me, Joe Farewell, you like multiple people just totally eating shit in the middle of stages. Someone <laughs> needs to do like a, a oh, three gun yeah. highlight reel. People just wiping out. I think it'd be awesome. Th- that's great. Hey, if you've if you've got video of you eating shit on a on a stage, email it to me. Send me a Dropbox link or something like that. David Three Gun Show dot com, and I'll put together a uh, a low light reel. <laughs> I think I think Joe Farewell alone probably has fifteen or twenty minutes of footage. Yeah, yeah. He and uh, <laughs> I think uh, Ben McNew did like a, a remix of Joe Fallen, which was just hilarious. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's cool to see uh, people getting more active on the the socials and stuff and having fun uh, with shooting and not being like so serious of like, you know, I'm Mr. Badass Shooter guy, you know. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. We, we all, we all make mistakes. I mean, uh, Jake Latola runs into walls. I fall <laughs> going into corners. Um, Joe, Joe jumps onto bed springs and falls down. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. One of, one of the, uh, videos of mine that, um, has done the best on, on Instagram is me pulling up with a, uh, a stage gun or bread, a 92 F where the, uh, the, sl- the, the, uh, safety is actually closer to the sights than your thumb. Mm-hmm. And uh, I pull up, and since I shoot a Glock, I pull the trigger and just goes dead, dead, dead. And I'm like, ah, and slam the thing off. So dropped a couple seconds on that one, and you can hear, like, my squad laughing in the background and stuff like that. Absolutely. I mean, that's the stuff that, uh, I mean, there, how, how many footage, how many seconds of footage and probably hours of footage are out there, people burning stuff down. And I think you got to put the stuff out there where you just, uh, where you you really fumble and mess up. And I think that's the stuff that people really want to see. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it, it gets the most play anyway. It brings the, uh, the most joy to people's life. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause I could, I could laugh for hours, uh, on Joe falling down, but Joe shooting a really good stage. It's like, Hey, nice work, buddy. Yep, exactly. It's like, <laughs> eh, that's boring. Fall down already. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Fall down, dance. Well, uh, well, Josh, you and I have, uh, talked quite a bit uh offline since uh since the last time you were on the show 
And uh, for those uh, who haven't heard that one yet, we will uh, uh, I'll link up up to that in the show notes at threegunshow.com. But um, you've actually helped me through like a, a lot of things of uh, you know issues that I'm dealing with in uh, in my own game. Just talking them out with you, and we kind of figure out uh, either solutions or just like, huh, well that sucks, <laughs> and we move on. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes it's just like, well, I don't know what to do with that, dude. Um, yeah. Go talk to someone better than me. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds terrible, Dave. <laughs> well, one of, the, one of those things was, uh, um, I guess, just the, uh, the whole concept of, like, man, I should be shooting better than I am. Like, I, you know, there's, like, a, an expectation that I have for uh, my shooting. And, you know, a lot of times I rarely meet it. And I guess we kind of decided that, that's something that we (laughs) share in common and uh and a lot of people probably in this uh in this community are um do that when they walk away from matches they're like you know i really thought i was going to shoot better i thought i was more prepared and uh and things of that nature so how do we uh how do we deal with that how do we fix that well i mean this is a this is an interesting topic and one that i think spans across many many sports but i think first of all i think um you have to agree and i think most of us do that the three gun and the shooting sports in general is probably 90 percent a mental game mm-hmm. so your your mental mindset coming into a stage coming into a match how you carry yourself through the match through the ups and downs and the roller coasters that occur during a match is really what determines your performance because at the end of the day there probably isn't a massive separation between um, the guys in the top five and the guys in the top, you know, top 20, top 30 in shooting ability, mm-hmm. right? There's, there's the pretty close at some point. Um, there's a, there's a line where I think the, the percentage difference in just raw shooting ability really isn't a lot, but it's probably more towards their mental preparation. But as I think back to like, and I, I by no, just kind of a qualifier here, I by no way, shape, or form do I have this 100% figured out. I'm kind of drawing these conclusions slowly over my own shooting career, analyzing my match performances, good, bad, average, et cetera. And this is the kind of conclusion I'm starting to draw. And I went even deeper back into other athletic endeavors that I've been in and thought about the different pressures and mental expectations and how they affected my performance. Um, one of the things that kind of dawned on me not too long ago is, uh, back when I was racing bikes, you know, in college and stuff. And, uh, I, I kind of did this mental assessment or did this look back and I realized that every race I ever raced that I had family or friends come to watch me race were some of my worst performances I ever had. Really? And they didn't make any sense because it, none of them really aligned aligned with, uh, say, maybe an injury or like a, a bad training cycle, or I was cycling up or cycling down on a particular, you know, training build um, per my training program. But it was those expectations, right? It was that it, it kind of comes down to trying too hard. Yeah. So, and and I never I was I was pretty I was a lot younger. You know, this was this was like 2001 to 2007. So I mean, it's quite a few years ago. I was a, a lot younger, probably not as introspective as maybe I am now. Uh, and I never figured out why. Why couldn't I perform to my ability when I had my mom and dad, girlfriend, friends, hometown race, whatever it was, right? And um, it wasn't until you know probably a few months ago I started to kind of think about this expectations thing a little bit. And, uh, and that kind of dawned on me. I looked all the way back then and I'm like, you know what? I think I put so much pressure on myself to perform because of who was there or the importance of the race or what it meant. I think it really took away from my focus to just execute the way that I knew to, knew to execute. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I can totally relate to that. And I think a lot of people yeah. can, you know, especially when you've, you've got like a, a buddy coming out to watch you shoot or. You know, you're shooting on a squad of, of people that you know and that you want to impress or something like that. Yep. It, oh, yeah. So you're, you're cycling. You're, uh, you're biking. You call it biking. Cycling? Biking. Cycling. Yeah. Uh, your cycling career involved, and I didn't know this until we were chatting at, uh, at Pro-Am, but involved um, time at the uh, Olympic Training Center, right? I did a little bit of time at the training center um, before I went across to Europe um, and raced for a uh, kind of a semi-professional professional team there, and then a uh, a development team that was kind of a U.S. tied into the U.S. national team. Right. So when you when you were deep into cycling, I mean, granted you were younger, and like these these uh, mental performance topics would bore me to tears when I was younger. I never ever thought about them. Right. But yep. it's true that if you go back and look at 
uh, things that you've performed in prior that uh that you can see how how big of a deal it makes now was there any sort of like mental game training involved in anything that you did with cycling no we didn't get too terribly into it and it it it's probably probably a mistake i think it's something that you know you look at these younger athletes um and a lot of them have all these great physical skill sets they're kind of at the prime of their their physical ability but you know Unless you've got someone, I think, who's really taking care of that, that mental management side of things, I, I think that you're not going to get the most out of uh, the most out of it. And I, I remember back in, in my cycling days, and this is kind of not to draw a whole bunch from my past, but um, your prime years and historically in the cycling community was from like 28 to 34. It wasn't at 21 huh. and 22. And I think a lot of that had to do with the mental, the mental maturity, kind of the overall toughness experience all plays into it but but all of that and, and what's funny is when it comes back to that kind of that expectations piece i remember having some of the best i won i won more bike races when so when i when i trained in cycling uh we would usually go on a six to eight we call them macro cycles so you would build you would build your training regiment toward a goal toward a peak and you would do that over the course of six to eight weeks with kind of over overloading your body and training parameters to try and drive to a top physical peak performance. So you try to pick major milestones. You could usually only get two or three peaks of seasons, which you could physically be able to attain. And you'd pick these milestone races to build to these peaks. And so with that came these expectations. And I never raced well when I was when I was the most physically capable. I won all my bike races off peak. Huh. When, when I showed up to races, when I wasn't on peak, peak performance, I had to race smarter. And my expectations, there were no expectations for me to do well. I remember once going to a big stage race and uh, my coach being like, well, you know, you're, you're, you're sliding down the backside of your peak. Your performance is going backwards. Your body's in recovery mode. You're probably not going to do too well in this race. Just go up there, enjoy it, support your teammates. I won the whole damn thing. I won three races, um, won every stage. I mean, it, it was like, it was crazy. It shouldn't have happened, right? But right. what it was, was it was the lack of expectations. And then if you talk to, uh, it's the same thing. If you talk to like guys who golf casually, guys who like maybe play golf 15, 20 times a year, they do it for fun. They're maybe not super competitive. Mm -hmm. Almost every one of them will tell you the first time they play golf in the spring is their best round of the year because they have no expectations. They haven't swung the clubs. They haven't been practicing. They haven't shot any rounds. They go out and shoot great. Now, all of a sudden they've got expectations. They're like, yeah. oh man, last time I played, I shot a, I shot a 37. I can definitely shoot a 37 again. Wow. You just shot a 45. Nice job, dude it's expectations. Yeah. You know, that, that's such a good point. Like the, uh, I, I came back to, uh, to Denver here and I've been shooting with, uh, uh, my buddies that I've been shooting with for years. Right. And just going out and having fun and doing uh local matches and not, not really caring, you know, in my head thinking like, Oh, it's, it's a local, you know, just 20 mm -hmm. bucks going to have some fun. And I shot two penalty free matches and actually, you know, finished quite well on both of them. Yep, and I wasn't able to do that at the previous like what three matches, shoot penalty free, which is like a simple thing. Like the basic thing is like don't get any penalties, right? Yeah, and shoot all your targets, don't forget anything, penalty free. Yeah, exactly. And I wasn't able to do that like on the uh, the previous. I want to say three majors. Um, yep. Yeah, previous three majors because of all the uh, you know the the pressure or whatever, and then the the last two matches where I just kind of relaxed and like oh we're out here to have fun penalty free yeah. matches and you know so this year i mean coming into my this is my third full season of shooting um i've been i've been lucky that i've been able to pick up a lot of sponsorship and and with that kind of comes uh, a lot of pressure that we put on ourselves to perform right we want to legitimize the kind of where we are in the sport and i remember showing up to to texas to shoot the uh the uh, vortex shooter source match yeah and I, i'm on this huge squad with Ruben and Tate, Dylan, I mean, all the, all the big Vortex crew shows up and we've got some, some execs from Vortex down there kind of watching the match. And, um, and I remember just, just grinding myself into this, uh, expect just, just overloading myself with these huge expectations to perform and legitimize my place on that team, legitimize my place on that squad. Um, and it ruined my match. I mean, yeah. it really did. I put so much pressure on myself and uh, it's taken me the better part of this season to kind of figure it out that putting all this on myself is all me. My, I mean, every sponsor I talk to, I mean, to say they could care less is maybe a little strong, but they really don't. My sponsors, and I think any of the sponsors out there really don't care 
about performance as much as we think they do. They right. really don't care that you're out winning. They care that you're a great brand ambassador. They care that you're a stand-up person, a strong individual in the community that promotes their products, that promotes you know promotes what that company um, stands for, right? Mm-hmm. And and it, and also drives sales and, and and customers to their doors, right? That's really what they care about. So all this pressure and all this expectation we put on ourselves because we put in a lot of work, we put in a lot of time, we put in a lot of money into this. Um, so there's a lot of uh, self-built expectations, um, I think, to perform. And I think if I think for a lot of people, and everyone's a little bit different, but I think if you take a step back, for me, when I've taken a step back and just said, you know what, I'm going down here to shoot my guns, to hang out with friends, and have a good time. Mm-hmm. And not take it so seriously and just have a, have a good time with it. I'm going to show up. I'm going to walk my stages. I'm there to win, but I'm not going to walk away like I'm completely, I'm a complete failure because I didn't get inside the top five or inside the top 10 or I didn't win the match. Yeah. Um, I think for so many of us, I think we'd probably benefit a lot from that perspective versus just, um, just, man, I got to be in the top five. Otherwise I'm a failure. I've just totally screwed this up all this time. All this money is for nothing. Right. Well, so how, how do you balance then the, uh, the desire to do well, uh, with, uh, I guess with your, with your actual performance, like how do you go in with no expectations, but still want to still expect to do well? Like it's a total mental game of, of uh, balance there, right? I think the desire to, to do well is what drives your training. Okay. So if you, if you want to do well, you're going to put the work in, you're going to put the time in. When it comes to match time, and this is, again, this is kind of my, my conclusion I'm slowly drawing. When it comes to the match, you're going you're gonna to fall back on the level of training that you've put in, mm-hmm. regardless of desire. And all that desire, it's almost like worry, right? If you flip it on the other side, worrying about something happening, worrying about um, anything, worry is just a wasted, a wasted piece of mental capacity, right? And it just brings about nothing. Yeah. Worrying doesn't solve a problem, right? Worrying so I is think uh, ha- living in the... Uh, what is it living in the future? It's not being present, right? Exactly. And then guilt is living in the past and not being present. And I think expectations almost living in the future, right? Yeah. Because yeah. if I'm so worried about where I'm going to finish and I'm on the first stage of the damn match, I'm not in that. I'm not in the present. I'm not on that stage. I'm not on the next stage. I'm all. I'm two or three days ahead. Yeah. Worrying about what the number, where the numbers are going to shake out, versus one stage at a time, one. You know, one gun at a time, one string of fire at a time, one piece at a time in the present, and ultimately there to have fun. If you have, I think if you have fun and you just try to, to to have that mentality and thought process, I just think it's gonna for me. This is where I'm what I'm really coming down to. I think I'm just gonna I'm gonna do so much better. I think my performance is just gonna increase. So this, um, what you just said there, reminds me of it's process based thinking versus outcome based thinking. Right? Absolutely. The outcome Absolutely. is you're you're putting so much pressure on either the top five or the top ten or wherever you're at in your in your uh, your game or your performance, and then process based is like you said the training, getting your your training in, getting good reps in, making sure you're adequately prepared for the match. Yep. Whether that's gear, it's nutrition, it's your physical health, it's your sleep. Those are all yep. process based. I think if you spend your mental energy on the process-based based items, your preparation for the match, your your training regiment, all the things you just said, and that's what you're focused on throughout the entirety of the match, I think the performance will take care of itself because you're gonna you're gonna take things one step at a time. You're gonna go from step one to ten on one step increments all the way to the end. You're not thinking ahead. You shoot a bad stage. And now your you know, your your thought process has instantly gone to I've blown this match my match is over with blah blah blah, um, you're you're not going to shoot well I mean mm-hmm. you're just not you're you're th- the last big match I shot was the Michigan State uh, championship match mm-hmm. and the very first stage of the match I had a stage DQ first DQ of any kind I've ever had I uh, I I boneheaded a slug into a steel uh, into a bird shot target mm-hmm. steel popper shot it at 12 yards with a slug stage DQ right so I'm in the hole from the beginning I'm not going to win the match right. right? Yeah, not gonna, there's no way I'm gonna win the match. There's too many good shooters there for me to win the match. But I, I just I kind of told myself like I'm here. I'm here to have fun. I'm here to shoot. I'm hanging out with a bunch of friends, people that I like. You know, I'm gonna shoot the best match that I can, one stage at a time. 
And I honestly told myself, I said, I'm just going to go to each stage and I'm just going to run the stage just like I normally would to win this match. And we'll just see what happens. And it's going to be fun to see what happens, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I went on to win, I think, three stages out of the the seven total. Nice. A um, whole bunch of top fives and a fifth place with a stage DQ. Huh, crazy. Right? <laughs> Which, I mean, I think that was almost more exciting than, than getting first or second in the match because I, I battled back. I didn't mentally let it shut me down. Right. And ulti- ultimately, I just focused on having fun. I just I just was hanging out with, I was hanging out with Jason Carrillo and a bunch of, bunch of good dudes, and we just had a blast. And it, it turned into just a fun match to have fun. And just keep shooting and see what happens, right? I don't know how and you could I, have a... I'm more, I'm more proud of that fifth place with a stage DQ and battling back to that point than I probably would have been, you know, finishing first or second place in the state championship match. Yeah. I don't know how you so could I have think a... it was a, I think it was a better mental achievement for me than just shooting a great match, seven stages, and, and walking away with the win. Definitely. I don't know how you could have a bad time hanging out with Jay Carrillo, too. Oh, yeah. Jay's awesome. He <laughs> makes everything fun. So... So what's your what's your self talk then when when uh, that stage DQ happens? You know, you said you're gonna focus on fun. Did you take five minutes, get you know deep breaths and stuff like that? Like, how did you reset your your uh, your plan? I'm still working on this. Something Ruben challenged me with. Um, I think at Texas, I'm probably gonna try gun when I shot with him. Um, is that when I have a bad stage? I think I would definitely tend to dwell on it. I'd go right to the past, right? If I could just have this one stage back, if I could have that one target back, if, yeah. you know, and I would just, I would la- I would just belabor it and I would, I would let it, I'd let it occupy what I was thinking about instead of thinking on the present, think about what I had to do next. What was, what was next on the plate, right? Mm-hmm. So, so Ruben challenged me really hard with that and I took it to heart and really, really started to really started to try to think about that more and more. Um, and it really is that just what's next, go right to my next stage plan. And I've been doing that more and more. Um, even as soon as I'm finishing shooting a stage, I take my stuff, I go off the range. I mean, you get kind of a, you get a, you get a free pass. Obviously you don't have to reset your own targets. You have to reset the next one. So I'm instantly on reading my notes for the next stage. I'm reloading my ammo. I'm getting my belt set up for the next stage. So I try good or bad to 100% mentally go to the next stage. I'm going to, from that point forward on my, if I'm thinking about something, I'm thinking about what I'm shooting next, not what I just did, Mm -hmm. good or bad. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm already engaged in the very next thing I'm going to do. Um, that's, I think it's one of the ways I've kind of tricked myself into not just, not just laboring over those, uh, those past mistakes or that bad stage or that stage DQ. Yeah. You know, the, uh, um, at that match, the Vortex Shooter Source match, uh, y'all stayed in house with a ton of, you know, really good shooters. And I came over to visit one night and, you know, everyone was looking at their match videos. They're prepping for the next day. They're, you know, going over holds and stuff. And I was thinking like, man, I'm not taking this seriously enough. And, (laughs) and, uh, (laughs) there was, there was a lot of, uh, I don't know what you call it. Brooding, lamenting. There was a lot of, uh, stewing in the house amongst a lot of people yeah. on the day's performance, you know, and, oh, if I hadn't done this, if I hadn't done that. And it, so I guess uh, there are a lot of a lot of shooters I respect. So I was kind of looking at it thinking like, wow, you know, maybe I should take this more serious and maybe I should concentrate on on shit that I did poorly and uh, and let it really affect my sleep that night and stuff. So it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting balance, you know, of caring enough and then caring too much. It is. I had that conversation at that match with uh, with Andy Peterson, you know, and, and and I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but Andy's words to me is like, dude, you've got all the skill set to be one of the best guys out there. You shoot really well. It's like you're faster than almost everybody, blah, blah, blah. He's like, but you're you're trying too hard. You care too much about the outcome. You're So there's a such thing as like wanting it too bad to where the outcome starts to affect performance. He's like, just dial it back a little bit, have some fun. You know, and it, it's taken me all season. I mean, it's been a bit of a roller coaster. It's, I've gone from, you know, some some poor match performances to some really good match performances, and I'm really trying to dissect what was different between them, what was different in my mindset. And uh, again, that's the conclusion that I'm really that I'm really kind of uh, coming to is that um, that pressure we're putting I'm putting on myself to try and win or to prove or legitimize where I'm at or what people think of me, it doesn't do anything for you. It really doesn't. It's, um, it's probably making, probably making me worse. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, no. so what's the what's the move going forward? How do you fix that? Um, I'm really focused. I mean, I, I've uh, I've got "have fun" written on almost every piece of my gear now. I'm just really? like write, writing it in. Just have fun, have a good time, smile, enjoy your time. Right. So, just really trying to think positive. I, you know, it, it, it's funny because in my my professional life, um, I I preach positivity a lot to my to my people, people that work for me. It's just you know a good positive outlook finding the best in situations, not being blind to what didn't go well, but let's focus. And I, and I have the same approach when I work with shooters who, who I'm helping kind of to improve their game, right? They'll call me after a match and, and they'll want to, everyone instantly wants to go into what they didn't do. Right. 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 What's the, when you ask them, Hey, how's your match going? Well, blah, blah. how many people like say, dude, I destroyed stage three, right? Nobody yeah. ever start leads with that. Everyone goes right to the negative. What did I not do? What did I screw up that would have put me in a better place? Right. Instead of going, right into what um what i did well right so when whenever somebody calls me that i'm working with um i'll stop them right away or even i'll, I'll start the conversation with hey, hey how's it going tell me what went well i want to hear that first like re-imprint what went well and why did it go well and understand that and build on it and okay now and i'm gonna be blind to what didn't go well um and and i think if there's things that didn't go well that are like um that are like gear issues, get them fixed, but don't dwell on them because it's not fixing anything. Right. If you had a bad, bad performance moment, then let's understand what you made a mistake on. And then how do we fix it? And how do we, how do we put a bandaid on that and get it, get it, get it fixed and corrected. But what did you do? Well, you know, what did you do? Well, that you dip, typically don't do well. And why did it happen? Right. If you went lights out on long distance rifle, you know, did we, did we enact something great in your training that made that better? Did we, did we adjust something in your technique? Well, what, why did that go well when previously it didn't? I think it's important to understand that more so, right? Mm -hmm. It's that whole like leading with your strengths and, 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 and mitigating your weaknesses, that whole concept, right? Right. Yeah, so I think that's a huge part of it. And, um, you know, kind of, kind of a segue into this expectation piece. One of the most common things I hear from guys, and, and I'd say this is really common, um, I would say guys that are kind of around about, I'd say, where I am. You know, and, and, and I, I have no delusions of where I am. I think I know very, very well where I kind of fit in the pecking order of shooters. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I think I would say guys within probably 15, 20 percent of where I am, I hear this all the time. And I would encourage anyone who kind of says this to themselves to take a step back and think. But I hear this all the time. If I could have just shot to my ability the whole match, I'd be in there. Oh, uh, yeah. I've heard that quite I a bit. I love it. If I could just shoot to my ability. So. I heard I heard that, and I'm not going to throw names out there, but a couple of guys that are, I'd say, again, I'd say kind of right around that peer, that peer area to where I'm at. If I had just shot to my ability, I would have done so much better. So the, the last time um, th this one guy said this to me, I, I, I kind of looked back at him, and I wasn't being mean. I just said, so tell me what you think your ability is. And, and it wasn't me preaching to him. It was like, let me talk through what you're thinking. I used to say that to myself all the time. So tell me what you think your ability is. And his answer to me is like, it's like, dude, he's like, when I, when I, when I freaking hook up, I, I can shoot top three stages at majors and I've done it before. I said, yeah, yeah, you can. That's right. And, and then I asked him, I said, I said, but, but what does your match look like? So, like, oh, it's like top three and 50th and top 10 and 30th and top five and 90th. Right. So, so when I, when I kind of flipped the question back at him and I said, I said, as a whole, I said, are you, are you counting your ability as a single performance on a stage or is your ability really your ability to bring it together for a whole match? Hmm. Because I, because I tell you that if you're a, if you're a pretty, pretty good shooter, I would say, uh, if you're a better than average shooter, if you go out there and light it on fire, take all kinds of risks. It's pretty easy to one out of 10, two out of 10, maybe even three out of 10 times, throw a stage up there in the top five or even stage wins. Mm -hmm. I remember my, my very first uh, major match, FNH championship, everybody was there. It was a huge match. I was as green as green could be, right? I had two stages in the top five. They were ugly. I <laughs> shot three times the number of rounds and needed to go down there. I looked like a blind squirrel going nuts, right? <laughs> And I just got lucky enough that I sprayed enough bullshit and I ran fast enough <laughs> and had no semblance of a, of a nice, smooth stage plan. Yeah, those were top five stages. Looked like a superstar, right? Right. And then the other, the other six stages, wherever it was, were in the toilet, right? Mm -hmm. That's not my ability. If you shoot on the, on the, 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 
the hair edge of failure and out of control, once in a while you're going to hook up, right? And I'm exaggerating yeah. a little bit. So I, I think when people say shoot to my ability, I could be so much better. I think if you really take a look at what that means and what that means across an entire match, it's shooting to the right risk versus reward for your ability that you can maintain some consistency. Most of us just yeah. need to get the roller coaster flattened out a little bit. And I, I went and did some research, and I think I pulled up five or six major matches. And this is, I think this is crazy. I don't know if anyone, I'm sure someone has done this, but I don't think I've heard it on the show before. If you shot 85% on every stage, if you, if you average 85% on every stage, that's a top three finish in every, every major match I've seen this year. No way. 85%. Add the points up. Go to a bunch and add, just give yourself 85 points huh. on, on eight or nine stages. It's a top three at every major match, just about every major match on the calendar this year that ran points. Think about that for a minute, right? That's not, that's not burning it down. Stage no. wins don't win majors. Stage wins don't win matches, right? Shooting a consistent match. You, you probably won't win with 85%, but you'll land somewhere between top four and top, top three, top four, pretty much every match if you can consistently average about 85 points a stage. And that to me, that really says something, right? Yeah, no kidding. To me, that's that's when you. And I think the best guys out there, and, and again, I always talk about Matt Cooper because he's, I mean, guy I knew, I trained with. I mean, if anyone's influenced me more on the sport, it's probably been him. I talk to him a lot, right? And he's he's a, he's a hell of a shooter. Matt's really, really good. I don't think people even realize how good he is. Yeah, I got to um, sh- shoot with him at uh, Generation Three. Him and yeah. uh, Nick Molina, both yeah. great dudes, great shooters. Yeah, exactly. Um, but that's uh, that's something that um, I think Matt really kind of figured out, and and he's at the point now where he knows where he, well, from his ability, where he can press to try and get those ninety eight, ninety nine points, hundred points in a stage, versus where is at a stage where he's going to play the conservative route when it makes sense for his skill set, how he's shooting that day, um, et cetera, right? So when you really get to know yourself and, and honest with yourself. Um, I think that you can start to play this game and you can really start to flatten out that roller coaster. Hmm. As soon as you start flattening out that roller coaster and you start consistently, um, I think a, a, a huge goal for any shooter that's kind of coming up and maybe in that 50, 60, 70, 80% range of the winner is try to shoot an entire match where your, your performance or your spread is maybe within 10 points on every stage. He shot 70 points in every stage versus a 90 and a 40, a, a 80 and a 20. Yeah. Right? If you start to level that out and then slowly start to bring everything up together by finding the efficiencies, I think you'll see more rapid improvement in, in, in shooting. It's, it's a lot more analytical approach than I, than I think a lot of people think about. Um, but I think a lot of people make, and, and me included, will make mistakes or they'll try and chase down the stage win at the risk of completely blowing the stage. Yeah, it's true, and that that chasing the stage win, it's uh, it's it's a uh, it's a dangerous game, but it's also like a very alluring game, you know. Oh, like, it is. I see, it is. Yeah. I see a lot of people just going for broke, and then they're you know whiny at the at the uh, results. Well, and it, it's it's like gambling, right? I mean, when you hook up, yeah, and you, you manage to get everything together, man. You feel like a superstar, right? And, well, and you you know, you know damn good and well that you didn't see your sights for half the shots you took. <laughs> you know, you, you weren't you weren't seeing your sights. You were stepping through stuff. You were sending four and five you know strings at a single target because you were moving too fast. Um, we've all done it. I've done it. You know, I've walked away from stages before and be like, God, I hope I hit something because yeah. I didn't see anything. Same right? here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you get back, you're like, sweet, I got lucky today. And it's, that's all it was. I mean, it's a little bit of skill, but it's a lot of just like, hey, you, you got pretty lucky. You push, you push pretty far beyond control, and you weren't dangerous. Hopefully you weren't dangerous, but you were beyond what you were really seeing. You were shooting faster than you could see your sights. Right. In which case, you're just gambling. You're just, at that point, you're, you're throwing it all, you let it all hang out there. Gambling is the perfect analogy to it because the, uh, the way gambling works is the, the random... Um, reinforcement encourages you to keep doing what you're doing. Absolutely. Right? It's like a jet. Ja- it's like a, what do they call uh, slot machines? You know, they, yep. they don't give out every 10th round or every 20th round. It's random and it's random to keep you hooked on in doing it 
because that's yep. the reinforcement that that uh, that keeps you pumping money into it. You know. Yep. Well, I'm excited to kind of exercise this theory a little bit. I'm going to push myself pretty hard. I've got Blue Ridge, Three Gun Nation Nationals, Bending, and Hard as Hell left on the calendar. So four pretty big matches. Yeah. Um, uh, I would say matches that um, that I would say I, I would traditionally feel a ton of expectation on myself to go out and perform. I'm shooting against these matches should all draw, for the most part, should draw a pretty good talent pool. Uh, so there's always that pressure to go out there and see how you measure up, how you measure up against the guys that are near you, how close you can get to the guys you know that are above you. Um, so kind of my big challenge to myself is to try and keep all this in perspective, to go out and have fun and not put a ton of pressure on myself to perform, but just show up to shoot and have a have a good time and uh, see what happens. So I'm I'm excited to I'm excited to give this a try and, and see if it works for me. Yeah, focus on the process rather than the outcome. Absolutely. So. You know the uh, I've I've done a little bit of research on on uh, like performance versus expectation of performance, and you know one of the things that seem like a common theme, and uh, you know this is all like sports psychology type stuff, but it's uh, um, the separation between performance and expectation creates anxiety, and then the anxiety is is the uh, the killer, right? Yeah. Anxiety leads yeah. to like burnout, and then people, you know what do they call it? Rage quitting and, and shit like that. So yeah, how yeah. do you, how do you mitigate the, uh, the anxiety that can be great that we can create in our, ourselves? I think, I think the anxiety piece, so I'm probably not the best person to ask this cause I don't get a lot of anxiety. I'm, I'm just, I don't, I never have. Um, I think I get a lot of excitement. I think I get a lot of, I definitely still get a lot of adrenaline, especially the first stage of a match. Sure. Um, after that, I, I actually don't get much at all anymore, which is almost a bummer because I used to love that rush. I know. Um, just before the buzzer would off, you just feel like you're going to puke and you had to piss your pants all at the same yeah. time. Yeah. It was a great feeling. I yeah. do both. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't think I've ever suffered a lot from anxiety and unless unless it was that anxiety, the expectations um, got in my head and that, that trying too hard piece. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I probably don't, probably don't know enough about, about that to really comment. So the uh, um, the preparation piece that you said that um, you're concentrating more on the, uh, the the processes here. What kind of yeah. what kind of preparation are you doing coming into these last four matches? Like, how are you going to make yourself peak at that higher level, but then you know still go out and have fun and and, and perform? Yeah, I think um, I think for me. And I think anyone now that with, uh, I mean, the internet's a wonderful thing in the shooting sport, right? We can go to any, any previous match and you can find somebody's 15 minute video of an entire, entire match. So, mm-hmm. um, over the, the this past week, I, I kind of watched two or three people's uh, videos of like 20, 2015, 2016 Blue Ridge. So I'm getting an idea of the flavor of that match since I haven't shot it before. Um, and I'm starting to dissect what, what are some of like the key skills needed for that match. So it's a pretty physical match. So I've, I've amped up my physical fitness a little bit, um, I'm trying to run. Um, I'm trying to run about 15 to 18 miles a week. Um, you know, just trying to get physically fit, uh, where I even more so than I am, so I can get into these tough positions and come out of them and being able to push a little harder in a longer stage. So that's something that is, I think is very specific. So if I go into those matches to where if I'm able to go out and run, you know, six or seven miles uh, continuously at a high pace, I'm going to have confidence in my ability to to execute a maybe a minute or minute and a half or two minute long stage. Um, right without worrying that I'm not going to be able to push through to the end and have to like, you know, take it back one gear uh, versus keeping the gas, keeping the gas down. So I think that's one piece that builds confidence. Um, I've heard that uh, Blue Ridge, for example, has got some, some pretty tough positional shooting um, and also a use of a lot of slings. So those are two or three things that I'm focusing on. So I'm, I'm doing a lot of dry, I'm dry firing with a pistol. I've got, a, got the rifle on my back. If I'm shooting my shotgun and loading my shotgun in the basement or on the range, I've got my rifle on my back. So, um, I think those little things just give you the confidence when it's time to do them. Um, and, and they're all just a little bit different, um, right? So it's not a big deal to shoot your shotgun or load your shotgun with a rifle on your back. But if you haven't done it in six months and then the first time you do it's on a stage and it's yeah. the first first step you take and you get bumped in the back, you're like, oh, man, I haven't felt that in a while. This is uncomfortable, right? <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't want to be thinking that. I want that to be just normal. I'm expecting it. It's been there. I've been doing it. So. For me, those are a lot of the little things you can do when you start to understand the flavor of a match. Um, 
you know, Three Gun Nation Nationals, they're, they're kind of known for having a, a fairly decent mix of some field courses, but usually some really good base stuff. So um, I'll be doing some footwork stuff, shooting some USPSA matches just because the, their, their high option stages are um, they're really indicative of fast gun manipulation changeover. So dumping a shotgun, going to a pistol, or going to a rifle quickly, getting in and out of positions quickly. Um, so that's probably the, the prep for Three Gun Nation Nationals. Um, Benning's one that I've not shot before, but I'm watching a lot of videos. It looks like a lot of fun. Um, so that one, I think my biggest uh, takeaway from last year is it looked to be a lot of challenging pistol shots. That was something I kind of noticed that there were a lot of tough, tough looking pistol shots. So yeah, I'll probably for sure. ramp, ramp up pistol pretty hard for that one. Yeah, I saw some of the uh, stages from, or I guess stage descriptions from this year's Benning, and it looks like uh, pistol heavy again. A lot of challenging pistol shots. Yeah, yeah. So I think that one's uh, the key for that one's going to be a lot of rounds for the pistol. Get ramped up on that, and then um, hard as hell is another physically demanding match um, with lots of lots of screwy stuff that you probably can't practice for because you just don't know. I mean, I don't know if we're going to carry an egg again and run through run through a whole weird stage and crawl under stuff or throw <laughs> grenades. I mean, you just don't know. So I don't know how you really prepare for a match like that, not knowing what they're going to throw at you, but. You can guarantee it's going to be physical. You can guarantee there's going to be some tough rifle shots. Um, probably make sure you're super dialed in with slugs because we had some long slugs and slug spinners and things like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the slug spinner ate a lot of people's yeah. lunch. Oh, it ate mine. I think that was the first slug spinner I'd ever shot, and uh, that was not fun. <laughs> I didn't do well on that stage. Yeah, I got I got greedy on that one. <laughs> I uh, the You know the... The conservative path is to hit the bottom plate, right, repeatedly. Yes. And so yes. I hit the bottom plate, I think, like, was it two times in a row or something? That, mm -hmm. And then the third one spins it, or maybe it's four. I don't remember. I don't recall. But I was almost to the uh, the point where it was going to go over. I got all my hits, and then I got greedy and tried to go for the top plate and then just miked twice and just just totally trashed. It's like, well, that was dumb. <laughs> Yep. I think I shot the bottom plate and then tried to go to shoot the top plate. I'd miss, come back down. I'd miss the timing on the lower ones. So I'd have to wait for it to come back. I hit the bottom plate again. I go back to the top, miss. Yep. <laughs> so I, and, uh, and I was shooting, and, and this year I'll take out some some heavier, faster-moving slugs. I, I shoot the low-recoil Fiokis. And yeah. I, I think if you want to smash a spinner, you probably need to get something cooking about 1,500 feet per second and really hit it hard. Oh, man. I got some, uh, I think, 1,600 Extreme or 1,500, 1,400, whatever they are. They yeah, got a bunch those of, hurt to shoot. Yeah, but, they do. Yeah, the, they're the right ones for that for that game. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Super. Yeah, they're uh, they're pretty accurate too, considering you know how fast they're going. They're just like accurate by velocity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. The uh, oh, so uh, Blue Ridge. Uh, we had to sling a shotgun last year too. Yeah. I recall because yeah, that, that bruised the back of my head. It's always a boner. I don't like <laughs> swinging a shotgun. You have a big tube. Well, actually, for Blue Ridge, I'm, you have to run. Well, you don't have to, but I'm putting a shorter tube on my gun, so maybe right. I won't have the tube sticking out as much and hit me in the head. But yeah. swinging a shotgun is no is no bueno in my opinion. But oh well. Nah, I'm not. I'm not a big fan of slinging a shotgun either. Um, but the uh, uh, you're right about Blue Ridge eight round capacity max, which is kind of cool. It's yeah. Andy's completely got his own rule set. I mean, he wants thirty round rifle mags. Eight round maximum in your shotgun. I mean, he he's got his own rule set, which is fun. It's just something different. Yeah, yeah, and it, it is a completely different game when uh, when you've got that eight round tube, because you'll find a lot of places, or at least I did, where it was advantageous to stuff two as you're running rather than wait yeah. for it to be a um, a quad. You know. Yeah, which is which is really tough, right? Because uh, most of most of us have our our loads. Well, I don't say most of us. My particular caddies are set up in quads, right? So if I just pull two off and my next set needs to be a quad, I've got two shells in the way. Right. So it's not gonna not gonna work too well. So yeah, I've I've never shot with an eight round tube, so I'm gonna have to do a little bit of a little bit of practice on that and just uh, see how it goes. Um, if I if I get in a situation today where I need to just put two rounds in my gun, I pull four. And just throw two in, and the two just fly out of my hand, just because I'm just so used to grabbing four. Yeah. So it looks like I'm missing a load, but I'm really just two, and the, the other two just go flying. I'm back shooting again. It's an expensive game to play, though. At a major, you rarely get yeah. those back. Yeah, you rarely <laughs> get those back. Yeah, but I figure all the costs you're spending to go to a major, what's uh, what's a couple of twenty cent shotgun shells? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, Josh, you mentioned um, uh, cycling, um, in cycling in cycling. 
so like peaking, you know, where you're, you're, I don't know how to say it without saying the word cycling. Your, your training is, is changing to where you're peaking before like a race. Yes. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a ramp up. Right. Yeah. So you, um, from a physical fitness perspective, from a, um, uh, from that perspective, your body responds to overload and the whole key is to, is to kind of, uh, slowly increase the level of overload. Um, across a period of time and try and drive your body into a peak performance. Most most athletes who have played at a high level and most stuff, they've probably experienced a, a, a physical peak and they maybe didn't know what was going on, but you almost feel like you can run infinitely, just infinitely. I could sprint for like forever. I don't feel like I'm getting tired. My legs feel like just extra light and fast and all of that. So I remember experiencing that in, in football and baseball back in high school, and I had no idea what it was. I just thought, like, man, today's just magic. I don't know what it is. It must mm-hmm. have been the Wheaties or something. <laughs> um, but what it was was I developed some type of a peak. Like, the overload was just enough through training and through games and blah, 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 and you built yourself into a, into a nice peak. And um, your body can sustain that, but it's a, it's a fragile edge. You can only maintain it for, you know, a couple of weeks right. um, before you start to kind of naturally slide back down a little bit, and your performance starts to um, – starts to tail off yeah yeah in, in weightlifting they they call it like cycles mesocycles microcycles etc yep. do you do that with your uh training in three gun i don't because a three gun three gun is a it, it's another one of those ultimately skill-based um games mm-hmm. um, with the physicality element to it so uh, there's good to have both right i i don't think being incredibly physically fit is absolutely not going to hurt you. And, and to me is a measure of benefit as long as your skill comes along with it as well. Right. Right. Again, to kind of put it back on golf, right. Being a, a super strong, athletic, flexible guy, it's going to help you help you golf. Well, as long as you still continue to maintain the skill set. Uh, I, I think it's very similar here as well. I think you've seen that trend in, in golf and other, other skill type sports. Yeah. Um, so I haven't, um, probably someone with a lot deeper understanding or longer time in the game than myself. Um, probably a great conversation with Jerry, (laughs) not me about, about the, the the cycle and training nature, um, on the skill side and whether he, he feels like he can build or overload himself to a, to a point where he feels like he's got a, um, he's reached kind of a peak of his skill set and can he maintain that? For me, I, I just try to I try to pick a target in a window of time or a, a match that I'm looking to, and then you know two, three, four weeks out, whatever I have available in my calendar, try to specifically train for the elements of that match to where I come in feeling confident with all three guns ultimately, both whatever I think is going to be the biggest challenge. Whatever if it's going to be a super heavy rifle match, I'm going to spend a lot more time dry firing rifle. I'm going to spend a lot more time long distance with rifle. If it's a lot of fast paper burn down stuff with the rifle, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and shoot a lot of PCC matches. Um, I'm gonna really work on my shooting my rifle on the move, rolling between my 45s back to my primary optic for offhand. I do a lot of offhand stuff, so that's how I approach that piece. I wouldn't definitely wouldn't say I, um, to the point where I was with the physical stuff of cycling, um, like macro cycling or micro cycling up to a peak fitness. Right. Yeah, and, and it's it's interesting too because you, you know you mentioned earlier that you can probably do that three times a year. Where, well, we have way more than three matches a year, so yeah. I wonder. Yep. I wonder if maintaining like a constant level of skill preparedness is uh, is where it's at versus cycling. Unless there's, I think it de- I think it depends on you and your personality, right? And then and also how long you've been in the game, mm-hmm. right? So. Uh, I had this conversation with Josh Froelich. Um, you know, he and I have both been playing this game about the same amount of time. Um, you've got to balance the constant, constant shooting, dry firing, all the effort, all the mental engagement with burnout. Yeah. Right? Because it's super easy to push yourself to the point to where it's not fun anymore, right? Yes. Where you just, you don't even want to be there, but you've done so much work to be there. It's a waste if you don't go. I've been there before in other sports and I haven't been there yet in three gun. But again, it's only been three years for me. So it's everything is, I still feel like I'm still learning so much. And I'm still, um, I haven't gotten to the point where I feel like I've really flatlined in my, in my, um, in my growth. And I think once you kind of flatten off a little bit and the growth becomes so much smaller and more incremental, 
you're having to work so much harder to see any bit of improvement. Mm -hmm. And I think at that point, uh, for me in my past, and everyone's different, right? Everyone's level of dedication, their their drives um, is a little bit different. In my past, when I've reached that kind of plateau to where any increase is 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 pretty minute and it's small and nuanced, but you got to work so much harder for it. Um, it can be hard, and I think that's where you really have to then. Uh, in, for me, I've got to start being very conscientious about taking breaks mm -hmm. and not pushing too hard, too far out. If I've got a match in eight weeks, and I start eight weeks from that point, just killing it, just dry firing like crazy, going to the range, shooting like crazy. Unless I'm really fresh or really motivated, and I can maintain that for eight weeks, I'll probably get to a point to where I'll reach maximum motiv motivation and energy. And I'll start to lose it before I get to the match, in which yeah. case I'm kind of sliding down on that motivational backslide. Mm -hmm. um, so understand that about yourself. Understand all of that um, and take breaks. I mean, it's it's not a perishable enough skill set, in my opinion, to where you can't walk away for a week once in a while. And if you're anything like me, if I don't touch a gun for a week, man, by the time I get it back in my hand, I'm just happy. I'm super happy. I'm excited. I'm excited to even get downstairs and dry fire if I just take a week off. And I think it's really good to do. I took almost the whole month of July off, and it was really nice. Nice. Just to, to barely shoot for a month and just kind of focus on some other things, get some stuff with the family and projects around the house. Um, I think it's good. I think it's good for everybody. Yeah, uh, I totally agree on that. Like for the uh, the, the mid-year off season, the mid-year off, off month or whatever, I'm a big yep. fan. Like I was, I was yeah. talking to uh, Scott Green about that kind of thing and he's like uh go shoot for fun like don't bring any of your three gun gear bring like a 22 out set up some pop cans and uh shoot for fun like remember why yeah. why we do this yeah or just go do something you don't usually do go shoot sporting clays or yeah speed or prs or, or something else or if you if, or just don't shoot go do something else right mm -hmm. it's uh you know we all have other interests um outside of shooting and there's there's uh this can be very monopolizing right i mean you're, sure. you're kind of I think you shoot more matches than I do, but at 14, <laughs> 15 majors this year, um, it's uh, it's hard for anything else in your life, right? It makes everything else uh, a little strained. So take that time to go go have some fun and just push the reset button. It's really nice. Yeah, and, and with uh, that's a very good point. And with what what I do, it's it's kind of weird because like even when I'm not shooting matches, I'm talking about shooting matches or yeah. putting out content about shooting matches or this or that. So it's it's uh difficult to get away from it and so i do i do kind of know what you mean on on the uh the burnout and i actually have been at matches where it's like i don't even want to be here and well you're you're officially an industry guy now right so, yeah I, mean, I, guess. <laughs> I, I think you need to manage your burnout conversations with guys like ruben or dustin felix or people that like they're live inside this industry all the time and still try to compete and how do they how do they balance that because for the most part, the rest of us have, you know, uh, uh, some other type of job that we do, and this is 100% hobby. For you, yeah. it's uh, it's blurring those lines quite a bit. Yeah, for sure, for sure. The uh, um, the break though, I think that's a uh, that sounds like fun. <laughs> when yeah, when you're done yeah, with absolutely. a match, like when you come back from, uh, you said Blue Ridge is your next match, right? Yep. Do you uh, put the guns away for a couple days, or do you uh, um, do you immediately start training for the the next match? Depends on the window of time, and I would say also depends kind of on my motivation. Mm -hmm. So, um, I usually don't put it down right away. Um, I will I will keep. I, I try to do something the day after a match. So even after I get home, even if it's just kind of dry fire and just kind of. Um, especially with something I feel like I need to work on. Like if I was struggling with my shotgun at the match for whatever reason, or things weren't going well, I usually want to kind of go out and try and address that problem right away. Yeah. Um, but again, it depends. Um, for, for Blue Ridge, for example, when I get back from Blue Ridge, I'll probably put the guns down for a little bit. I, I don't know how, but I, I back myself into uh, a pretty nutty schedule in November where I go from, from three gun nation nationals and the following weekend, I'll be at Benning. And the following weekend is Thanksgiving, so I'm traveling with family. And then the following weekend is hard as hell. So I, in four weeks, I've got three majors, oh, man. Um, two of which I'm flying to, and then one of which I'm driving to, and then I'm driving oh, down to North Carolina for Thanksgiving. So uh, I don't know why I did that to myself, but um, <laughs> I think leading into that, I'm, I'm probably just going to like shoot myself into shape. Uh, I'll do a little bit of training, obviously. I always do. But um, knowing all that that's coming, I'll I'll probably take a little break um, after 
um, right after Blue Ridge, give myself a week, and then and start to ramp up again. Oh, that's interesting. You know, you you mentioned uh, Josh Freilich earlier, and uh, I was chatting with him at uh, the Nordic Vortex Championship, and <laughs> or the Trigun, and he uh, he's saying, "Yeah, I'm gonna go home and do some dry fire tonight." I'm like, "Bro, we haven't even had the awards yet." <laughs> <laughs> like that's that's it's interesting how how different people are you know there's people like yeah. oh yeah i didn't i uh, didn't take my guns out of the bag didn't clean them and uh yeah. on to the next match and then there's people like uh josh and then uh you know you're somewhere in between yeah i mean in, in my mind right now what what appears to me from the outside and, and i know josh is i don't know scott green as well but josh and scott are two guys who have come on really really fast Right, mm -hmm. I, I yes. think Josh and I started almost the exact same time. I would definitely say that his success has far exceeded mine, um, but it's been simply because he's been incredibly motivated. I mean, he's he's put in tens of thousands of rounds through every one of his guns um, all season this year. Tons of live fire, tons of dry fire. I mean, he's super, super motivated. Um, he's just got one of those personalities that uh, he's just going to continue to to drive this as hard as he can. And I got to believe Scott. Scott Green's doing the same thing to have come on as quickly as he has mm -hmm. and to, to reach the level that he has reached. I mean, there's no, it's, there's no magic to it. It's just hard work. It's a yeah. lot, a lot of hard work. Well, and, and Josh has the, uh, the background in, you know, an MMA, which requires a ton of, uh, a ton of skill, a ton of work involved yep. and you totally get out what you put in, in that Scott has the background in baseball, which is the exact yep. same thing. Yep. You've got yeah, the background in cycling. Ultimately, it's ultimately it's how how much you um, how much you want to sacrifice or how much you can. What your situation is. I mean, um, I, I think Josh is incredibly lucky. He's got a range in his backyard, and it's and he can he can put rounds down range a lot more consistently than most people can, mm -hmm. um, which is a huge benefit, huge mm -hmm. benefit. And he's been he's he's proven himself to be a great brand um, advocate. So he's got the backing from some. I mean, he's got federal premium as a as a pretty large sponsor of his. So he's, he's not hurting for ammo, which definitely is also helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely helps. Well, Josh, we, uh, we talked about your, your matches coming up. What, what is, what is the thing that you're going to be focusing on once the shooting season's over? Um, so it's that time of the year right now. We're trying to figure out sponsorship stuff and contracts for next season. So I've started those discussions. So I'll be focusing a little bit of, uh, of my mental energy on that side of things. Um, I tend to do a ton of pistol work in the off season. I think it's the, it's the most perishable skill. And I've, you've probably heard everyone say that if you can shoot a pistol well, then you can shoot everything really well. So, yep. Um, that's a key, another key piece, um, that I'll continue to probably pour 80% of my off season into my pistol. Um, uh, again, it just transfers so well. Um, I'm going to continue to work on, um, on kind of the foot speed side of things. Um, I think I move pretty well, but I always see opportunity where I could get in and out of positions a little bit faster, a little bit better. Um, I'm getting older too. I turned 30, 36, 37 this year. So, I can feel myself slowing down a little bit from where I was two or three years ago, and I just want to stay ahead of that. Um, I feel like I've probably got six or seven really good years where I can, you know, before I before probably my physically I'm, I'm slowing down a little bit and I'm not as fast as I was. So mm -hmm. I want to stay ahead of that as much as I can, um, stay ahead of injuries and all that. So that's probably what my off season will be focused on. Yeah, and then you have to uh, buy a bunch of dots and shoot open. Yeah, luckily my eyes are really good for now, so I'm hoping they stay good for a long time. Yeah. Well, one of the uh one of the things that we've been talking about in the uh in the three gun community recently, thanks to uh, our buddy Dylan Easley, and uh and then of course, I just kind of hammered on it because it's a uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a fun thought exercise is uh rules, new rules. Uh yeah. is there anything that that you see in three gun that you can, uh, think can be improved or would like to see uh, change rule wise rules is an interesting topic right and and, and um we talked about three gun nation coming in trying to unify uh, kind of a standard rule set and and i think the sheer nature of from what i understand i haven't been in this game a long time but three gun i think really started and blossomed as a as an outlaw sport right mm -hmm. it was guys who kind of broke away a little bit or just didn't want to be tied in as much to like an IPSC or a USPSA mentality 
you got all these great matches that are built um, kind of on their, their own rule sets. I mean, the reality is from match to match, for the most part, there's very, very little difference. You might have yeah. different scoring. This match may only let you use a 30-round mag in TO. This, this match might let you use a whatever length tube you want in limited. Some do, some don't. Uh, it, it just varies. So there's a little bit of variance there. I think it's good that there's no major major gear changeover required from match to match amongst mm-hmm. the three big divisions, which is nice, right? You don't have to like have a whole set of different stuff to go shoot one match. So I think yeah. that's nice. I think keeping that um, mainstay is, is probably pretty important. Um, I think a lot of the discontent maybe with – I keep hearing um, TAC Ops and – open are becoming too close Mm -hmm. and i I think i disagree with that i think i think um adam maxwell kind of hit the nail on the head right um the the largest volume the biggest group of people is in to it's arguably the tech optics or 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 for you three gun nation guys practical the largest number of people probably the most competitive division is tech optics so and i think you're getting you're getting the 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 cream is rising in that group higher faster than than the others i think because of that so i think you're gonna get a for example i think your best shotgun guys loading quads is gonna run a shotgun stage or a shotgun section of a stage faster than probably 90 percent of your open guys because an open right now there there isn't a lot of super high talented guys there's a couple of guys um so it might be just the Josh Fralix or the Mike Whitesides that are going to win a shotgun an all shotgun stage over the TO guys, and the TO guys are going to be right behind them because for the most part, most of us can run and load. Uh, at the, we can load at the same speed that we can just running without loading. So loading is not slowing anything down for the most part. Um, so I think a lot of the a lot of the, I don't want to call it butt hurt, but a lot of the, the the perception there is they've seen the gap narrow, and it's because the skill set has improved, mm-hmm. not because the equipment. We're still having to grab shells in our bare hands, and, and I think that's the real differentiator. Whether the tube is 10, 12, or fourteen long, I don't think it really matters. The skill set has changed. People are loading shotguns lightning fast, and it's having less and less of an impact on the stage. Yeah. So from the shotgun side, that's my opinion. I say leave it. That's pretty cool with the uh, that the advance, like you said, is a skill thing and not an equipment thing. It wasn't like a piece of gear we had to go out and buy. It was a a technique. Well, I guess you had to yeah. buy caddies, but yep. So, but but again, to me, it's from gear to gear. A box fed shotgun that has huge capacity with a drum mm-hmm. and a dot on it is a huge advantage in in a lot of situations. It, in my opinion, an open guy's got an advantage there. Right. Um, he's got a comped shotgun with a dot and a drum in it. That's, I mean, that's that's a lot of difference from a iron sight, hand fed tube, you know, Breda, Benelli, Versamax insert, whatever brand you want here. Mm-hmm. To me, that's, those are wildly different games, wildly different shotguns. Oh, um, what do you think about the difference then between Tac Ops and Limited? Again, the, to me, the biggest differentiator there is you're limiting round capacity in all the guns. That's a, that's a big well, difference. And, and a non and a non in three gun nation. optic in three gun nation, you are. That's true. Yeah, but, and some of the other ones, you're some of the other uh, you're not. Yeah, I, I mean, you can run limited. a D sixty in limited in some in some matches. Yeah, which is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, but if it's a if it's a heavy rifle match, then you're still going back to the one power the um, the fixed power optic. Fixed yeah, for one sure. power optic being the big differentiator. And so if you're if you can cling steel at three, four, and five hundred yards with a one power optic, uh, that's a uh, that's a, to me it's an advanced skill set, um, and it's still a pretty big differentiator. But mm-hmm. uh, I don't play I don't play limited, so I guess I don't care that much. <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, if I'm being selfish, like I'm not going to play that division. I don't right. have the intention to play in that division, but um, I guess if I if I'm if I have an opinion on it, I think the the round count should be limited in the pistol. Round count should be limited in the rifle, and and same thing with the shotgun. And then uh, obviously the optic is what the optic is. What do you think about? Um, let's go back to tech ops since uh, since we actually shoot there. What do you think about um, downloading your shotgun on the start? Like we have eight rounds in the tube, and many people have twelve or fourteen round tubes. Yeah, 
I think you got to pick something because I, I think as soon as you say just fill it to whatever capacity you have, then you got people with 16 round tubes and it just becomes open. So right. whether whether nine is the magic number in the gun, why that held the test of time, it was probably because an eight round tube matched up with the length of the standard, um, whatever was like the, the considered the standard barrel length, which is probably like a 24 or 21 inch barrel. Right. That's probably how it started because it was even. Um, I'm fine with it. Again, I, to, me, to me, it's not broken, so I wouldn't fix that. I would. I agree with a lot of what Nick Miller said. I listened to your your episode with Adam. Mm-hmm. I think I think Nick Miller was the voice of reason across a lot of it. <laughs> Dang him. Yeah. Like I said, I'll get him a T-shirt. You know Nick, what Nick said. <laughs> Nick was right. <laughs> Nick was right. He's or, a he's a wise wise man. We should all listen to him. Awesome. Well, uh, well, Josh, we've covered a, a lot of topics here. Um, I'll let you uh, get back to your, your nice Sunday and your beautiful weather out there in Ohio. Uh, if you can leave the audience with uh, one thought or one piece of advice, something to uh, take away from our discussion today, uh, what would it be? I've probably said it a thousand times today, um, and it's what I keep telling myself, and show up and have fun. If you have fun and you focus on that, I think the performance will come with the hard work that you're doing. If you don't work hard, uh, and you just want to have fun, then you have no reason to um, believe you're going to do well. But work hard, but then show up to have fun. Awesome. I like it. Well, Josh, this has been a ton of fun, man. I, I always uh, enjoy chatting with you on the show or off the show about uh, about 3Gun and life in general. I think you have some really good perspectives, especially considering your, uh, your background in other sports that you can bring into 3Gun here. And I appreciate your time, man. Thanks for being on the show. Hey, man. It was great. I appreciate you having me. And for all of you listening, before you take off, check out the show notes at 3gunshow.com for links to things that Josh and I discussed in the podcast. You can also sign up to be a patron, uh, a 3 Gun Show supporter, if you will, or purchase uh, your very own 3 Gun Show logo tee, which which Josh has one. Makes his biceps look huge. (laughs) Yes, it does. It's uh, it's proven scientifically, analytically. Your muscles are twice as big (laughs) in a 3 Gun Show t-shirt. That's right. Uh, as always, this podcast is brought to you by Armalite, and Armalite has allowed me to get special pricing for listeners on their line of three-gun sh- three rifles, both 13.5 and 18-inch, as well as competition handguards, gas blocks, and tunable muzzle brakes. And if you're looking for any of that stuff, hit me up, Dave at 3 and uh, I'll hook you up with a great deal. A uh, quick reminder that if you enjoyed this episode of the podcast, subscribe in iTunes, Google Play, Podcast Addict wherever you get your podcast content so you can always get the very latest and uh, leave a review too. That really helps the, uh, the show. Thank you so much for downloading, listening, and subscribing to the show. I'm Dave Hartman, and I'll see you on the range. If you are finished, unload show clear.